She's a native of North Little Rock and is a full-time graduate student uh, as, at the University of Arkansas Little Rock. She works as a graduate teaching assistant for Drs. Floyd Martin and Lynn Larson. She research, received her BA in Art History, magna cum laude, from Southeastern Louisiana University in 2018. Her main research areas include the Italian and Northern Renaissance and, e and the English Romantic uh, period. Um, subjects relating to the Renaissance master, Titian and his masterpiece of Venus of Urbino uh, are the focus of her master's thesis, tentatively titled, Titian's Venus of Urbino, a new interpretation, which argues several uh, intensely debated topics surrounding the work, including motive, meaning, and patronage. She was recently awarded the first place prize in the category of graduate humanities for her presentation and lecture Marriage Rituals in Renaissance Florence and the Significance of the Italian Cassoni at the Research and Creative Works Expo uh, at University of Arkansas Little Rock in 2019. So we're delighted uh, to welcome her here this morning. And as you see, her title is Marriage Rituals in Renaissance Florence and the Significance of the Italian Cassoni. Uh, please uh, welcome Melissa Miller. <laughs> today for coming. I present to you now an amalgamation of, uh, of my work. Uh, this is a, a lot of pieces that I've been working on kind of put together into one presentation. So thank you again for coming. Marriage rituals among the elite families of the Italian Renaissance were much different politically and culturally than what they may uh, than, than our own time and tradition. In Florence, brides and grooms of ruling families were likely betrothed to one another without having ever met. The process was more like a modern day business negotiation. Marriage was more about power, continuation of the family dynasty, and controlling resources during the time Italy was divided into smaller city states. Marriage contracts could be lengthy and the ritual itself complex. The cassone, an Italian word used to describe wedding chests, played an instrumental part in displaying the wealth, status, education, and humanist ideas of a couple and their families during this period in history. Additionally, these beautiful wedding chests were culturally, artistically, and practically significant to the new couple in their household. In the past, Cassoni have been underestimated as a subject worthy of serious study by art historians simply because these objects lie between fine and decorative art. But besides their aesthetic and symbolic value, these splendid pieces of stately furniture offer a rare insight into the values of Renaissance Florence. Essentially, they provide valuable information on how family life was lived, albeit by families at the height of Florentine, uh, Florentine society. Betrothals in the, in, of the patriciate usually began when two families wished to unite in a way to strengthen military or economic ties within their ruling area. It was a business negotiation dressed up with pomp and circumstance. It was a, a, after the Council of Trent decreed a standard procedure for the sacrament of, sacrament of marriage, the Tamas D decree around 1563 that there was any attempt to regulate the Renaissance traditional mar marriage practice. Before this, Florentine families relied upon tokens of affection, such as handkerchiefs and ribbons and publicly notarized contracts to begin the legalization of the marital union. The smaller courting tokens carried forward into larger and costlier betrothal presents, presents which could include gifts of jewelry, luxurious silk linens, and clothing. It was these gifts that were exchanged in the presence of the family members of both the intended that solidified the marriage contract, which would have been an agreement of all the benefits of the alliance for each family. 
and the sum of the bride's dowry confirmed. The Roman Catholic Church's role in the ceremony usually happened after the vows were taken at the city notary and was blessed later during a celebratory mass. Engagement sometimes lasted several months or years. By the mid-1400s, the cassone became the main gift of the groom for his bride prior to the wedding day procession. After the earlier solidification of the betrothal contracts, the groom or his family would begin the process of commissioning the cassone, which would be used in the final wedding procession and then lastly in the couple's home. Prior to the strict enforcement of luxury taxes, these marital gifts were openly arrayed and processed along with the bride and groom to show the township their power and, 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 and enormous wealth. Sumptuary laws were created in the Middle Ages, but not rigorously enforced until around 1350. <clears throat> they were a way to regulate the ostentatious display of wealth of the Florentine elite, particularly in clothing and lavish public celebrations. This taxation law was designed so any Florentine citizen could make a denunciation report against another for their lavish display of wealth. So you can imagine how this may have played out in family rivalries. As a result, discretion was begrudgingly adopted by the elite in the types and styles of clothing they wore in public and how lavishly public celebrations were carried out. To minimize the luxury tax during the traditional wedding procession, a large chest was employed to conceal the expensive wedding gifts as well as the wives of the bride's trousseau and the cassone made its debut into Florentine wedding tradition. The opulence of the, of the marriage chest informed the public of the amount of wealth inside by including panel paintings and relief carvings by well-known artists, and lastly, heavily leaked in gold in case there was any doubt. <laughs> Interestingly enough, sumptuary laws changed starting around the early 16th century, limiting the level of decoration and ornamentation of cassone by also taxing them as luxury items. And this is one theory behind the, the style changing so dramatically with the disappearance of the painted panels and the gilding. Here is a rare depiction of a cassoni in procession with the wedding party by Loskesia, Trajan, and the widow around 1450. And I'm sorry for the blurriness, but I had to really get in there. But here's a, an example of a cassoni being led in the wedding procession. You can see that it is a gold color. We were assuming that it's leaked in gold and this, the side panel may have been done in a relief or a painting. In line with the humanistic thinking and ideals of the Renaissance, the highly decorated cassoni often depicted exquisitely painted or carved subjects appropriate and complementary to the couple, uh, such as representations of exceptional undertakings or stories intended to underline the strength of love, conjugal virtues, and cautionary tales reminding husbands of their duty and authority over their wives. Some overarching themes included Judith and Holofernes, Intervention of the Saving Women, the story of Esther, and heroic <coughs> military triumphs, including moralizing stories of antiquity with Rome on the winning side. Full suites of furniture may have been commissioned for a new couple's household, but it was the cassoni that was the costly of these pieces. Moralizing narratives on the outside of the cassoni were very important in articulating the couple's personal and family message. This chest is an example of a later style Roman cassoni after the style changed um, to where the, gild the gilding was removed and the, the painted panels are no longer seen. Um, and this Roman cassoni, that the moralizing story shown here is that of Judith and Holofernes, a popular cassoni theme. Typically, we associate the biblical story of Judith and Holofernes more solidly with the Italian Baroque artist Artemisia Gentileschi where we are accustomed to a much more dramatic and feminist rendering of the account of the beautiful widow Judith with the help of her handmaid in the very act of decapitating the drunken Holofernes. 
in the Italian Renaissance is illustrated in this later Roman Cassoni. The action is quite subdued as Judith has already relieved her oppressor of his head. The Cassoni itself has considerably a more Petrarchan feel to it, focusing more on Judith as brave, devoted, and sacrificing. Indeed, the takeaway moral of the story of Judith is although beautiful and strategic, she remained faithful to her husband even in widowhood, adhering to Jewish hospitality laws, and was able to unarm and destroy the powerful Holofernes without compromising her virtue. There's some details of, of that Cassoni. Um, we have the torso of Holofernes here, minus his head. And Judith both in triumph with Hall Fairness is holding his head in, in triumph here. And then prior to that, seemingly submissive to Hall Fairness so that she could gain his trust and acceptance, acceptance to his camp. I had to go back to my Bible and read the story so I could know exactly what was happening in that story. Um, This is the Nearly um, and Morelli Cassoni, and I'm going to show all, all of both of them um, to, uh, in just a moment. Um, it's how the, these are housed in the Courtauld Gallery in London, and they are exquisite examples of the highest level of design for these significant pieces of furniture. They were commissioned in 1472 by a wealthy merchant by the name of Lorenzo Morelli for his marriage to Vagia Nearly. In my research, I discovered Morelli opened a new household account in his ledger in the early part of 1472 to track the expenses he incurred when he took his wife home. The pair of chests he commissioned were the most expensive furnishings in his palace. These pair of cassoni are the only existing matching set, which also includes their accompanying spaghetti which is a type of wainscoting that includes a painted moralizing story panel set in an accompanying frame in the same style as the pair of Cassoni. You see the matching ensemble coupled beautifully here. Um, in the Corto Gallery, they have the, um, the spalier actually attached to the Cassone, but in a Renaissance home, these uh, would have been paired together in the home but the spalieri would have been mounted to the wall several inches above. In the way that it's attached now, it's hard for the lid to open up, and I'll show you a picture of the lid that it's just partially open. But in an Italian uh, palace, the lid would come all the way up to be able to access what, what may be stored inside. On the nearly chest front panel is the story of the schoolmaster of Phalaris. The town of Phalaris is besieged by General Camillus and the Roman army. A cowardly schoolmaster of the town offers up his students along with the keys of the town in exchange for his life. But the wise and honorable Camillus instructs the, the pupils to punish the treacherous schoolmaster while their fathers open the gates to their worthy conqueror. The moral of the story is to instruct Vagia Nerli not to use her children as bargaining tools in games of politics and war, and a lesson to us school teachers are not to be too harsh with our students, too, I think. The complimentary story of the Morelli Cassoni front panel conveys a convincing sense of the full drama of Camillus driving the Gauls from Rome, a classic heroic example of Rome on the winning side of world domination and a popular narrative for these beautiful chests. Miraculously, these Cassoni, his and hers, survived the changes of time and fashion intact. Selected with great care and deliberation, the choice of images provided both entertainment and moral instruction in an age of limited literacy. Here is the Mo Mo Morelli Cassoni with her lid open, this lid open, its lid open displaying the beautiful stenciled lid pattern exhibited in both of these chests. The, the stencil pattern is this similar in both chests. The existence of these matching set pieces is evidence that full complementary suites of furniture would have been commissioned by the groom during this time to set up house for the young couple. Within this research, no full matching suites of 
of furniture by the same craftsmen or artists of camera furnishings with documented provenience could be located. The Morelli and Nerli Cassoni with their matching spadiera provides a fine yet limiting example of how these types of household furniture were commissioned as a unit of, of complementary furnishings and set up in the home. This is a fragment from a Cassoni pan side panel representing the triumph of chastity, here meaning fidelity and marriage, a common subject for wedding chests. The central Madonna-like figure is in her triumphant part accompanied by virtuous women. This is another example of how humanistic values and ideals were articulated during a wedding procession. We see the central figure as the crowning glory of Renaissance society. She is well-mannered, beautiful, and skilled expertly in all arts appropriate to the education of a noble in the Renaissance, which would include household management, reading and writing in Latin, music, poetry, embroidery, and lastly, the fine art of navigating Florentine society. Most upper and ruling class families spared no expense in the detailed artisan work of these beautiful chests. As we have seen, the outside panels were made to inspire good behavior by the bride and to remind the groom of his duty as head of household. As told here in the work of Los Gesia, the front panels tell the classical story of the Sabines and Romans. One is Hercelia interrupting the battle between her saving father, Tadius, and her Roman husband, Romulus, rushing between the two and placing her babies between them in an attempt to stop their fighting, and the other representing the Romans and Sabines in full reconciliation. The matching chests represent two families that have come together finally in peace through marriage. Knowing this classical story enough to have it painted on a wedding chest heralds a humanist education to peers and indication of the groom's social standing and prominence. The story of the saving women reiterates the happy aftermath of an arranged marriage and is a pictorial example of how families should put aside differences and come together like the Romans and Sabines. A more recognizable neoclassical depiction of this story is illustrated beautifully in Jacques-Louis David's Intervention of the Saving Women from 1799. I have covered the outward message of the Cassoni and the importance of it in the wedding ritual. Now I would like to focus on its use and relevance after the wedding as it is utilized by the bride and groom preceding the nuptial festivities. Here's a view of the Cassoni de detail in Titian's uh, masterpiece, Venus of Urbino. Cassoni. In viewing this part of the composition, we see a clear idea as to how these cassone were used in practical ways in a Renaissance aristocratic environment and how they looked in 1538, the date attributed to this particular artwork. The pair of cassone in the background signifies the marital implications of this piece because of the association of the cassone to the marriage ritual itself. Indeed, ultimately, the Venus of Urbino was sold to Guidobaldo II della Robbia as a wedding gift to his young bride, Giulia Barano of Caramino. The chests in the composition look to be in the carved relief style of the mid-16th century Venice where Titian lived and worked. The chests look to be similar to a bombay-shaped body with a small predella and a flat lid capping the entire chest, similar in style, date, and location to this walnut cassone from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Within the Renaissance home, as seen here in the Venus of Urbino's detail, the chests were used in storing clothes, linens, jewels, and other similar items. They would also be used as a table when closed or extra seating. Some sources even mention them used as a small makeshift sleeping space for children. I'd like to also mention that Giorgio Vasari in short, says all the great houses had a custom. He talks about it in, in his lives of the artist too. You may have noticed earlier in the Morelli Cassoni slides some interesting patterning on the inside lid of the Cassoni. 
In some matching sets, as we see here again in the Parabola Sketcha, we enjoy a much more interesting composition than that of mere pattern. Cassoni also played an interesting, intimate role in a couple's private time. If painted in an allegorical theme, the inner lid almost always portrayed a beautiful yet provocative image of a fully nude female or male figure in the guise of Venus or another god or goddess of antiquity as shown in, uh, by this pair of Cassoni. There is little wonder at the intention of these seductive and provocative paintings. The inner lids of the Cassoni were meant to help stimulate sexual intimacy between the couple with the hope of conception. The intention of these nude images was to encourage both the bride and groom in their conjugal duties. It was believed in Renaissance times a woman's orgasm was linked to the conception of a preferred male child. And in a time when birth rates and lifespans were low compared to ours today, they needed all the help they could get. <laughs> Here is Titian's masterpiece, and it's in, or my my belief, it's his masterpiece, my consideration of his masterpiece, it's in its entirety in the Venus of Urbino. We see that Titian, in keeping with earlier Renaissance Cassoni tradition, has done something unexpectedly different and has relocated the sensuous goddess of the inside Cassoni lid to a new pictorial space within a two-dimensional painted work. According to author and art historian David Rosen, Titian's Venus of Urbino is exactly what is being represented in Los Gesius, um earlier Cassoni lids, and it was meant to help the couple in their young the young couple in their conjugal duties. I can hear the conversation in my head now between a Florentine couple. Honey, you get the Vino, I'll open the Cassoni. <laughs> <laughs> Many times these matching uh, Cassone would have a his and her version on the lid, a renaissance equal opportunity. <laughs> After the final wedding procession, the Cassone became a primary furnishing for the marital bedroom in the household of the groom. The main bedroom or camera of an Italian renaissance home functioned as a reception area, business office, birthing chamber, and lastly, private sleeping quarters for the owners of the palace. Here's a reconstructed bedroom from the 16th century to illustrate how such a room may have appeared during that time. The Cassone of the Florentine Renaissance served as a spectacular testimony to a time in history where social tradition and the ostentatious show of family power and wealth were important to the political fabric of that era. Modern day art history has not just outlined the context in which the Cassone can be discussed, it has created a platform for how these chests were evaluated. No other category of home furnishing holds the responsibility of its history so steadfastly. However, the art of creating Cassone or wedding chests fell out of fashion by the early 17th century in, in Florence and was not rediscovered with any enthusiasm until the 20th century. The Cassoni today may be recognized in many cultures, uh, many world cultures, by a different name, but the significance is still just as important as a coming of age tradition in the lives of a, of a newly engaged or married couple. In the United States, the tradition of the Hope Chest gained a resurgence in the 1950s and 60s, but today has again waned in popularity for young people and not a well-practiced tradition. As art historians continue to learn and write about the historical and, uh, the historical and societal significance of wedding chess, and in light of the changing social climate and the legalization of same-sex marriages, gender equality, and the redefining of the family nucleus, Maybe it's possible that Cassoni could emerge anew as a popular household furnishing. Mm -hmm.